Hey, and welcome to the short stuff. I'm Josh. There's Chuck. We're the banana splits. And this is short stuff. Let's go. I thought you were going to say, we're bananas for banana flavoring. I should have. I think we should retake this whole thing, frankly. Nah, yours is better. No, no way. Not not by a million years. Yours was better than mine. Uh, This is a good episode. Hats off to you for putting it together. Thank you, but the hats really come off to a few, a handful of astute listeners, Chuck, because I had no idea about this until in our watermelon episode. If you'll remember, you started talking about how just far off a uh, like banana candy flavor is from actual banana taste. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you're absolutely right. And they just like they just missed the mark so badly. But after we we talked about that, um, we didn't realize we'd accidentally stumbled into kind of like a overlooked history of well, at least flavor science, if not pop culture, that some of our listeners wrote in and said, guys, guys, get this. That banana flavoring actually is really dead on to a banana that we don't eat anymore. It was created yeah. back at a time when there's this banana that's not around any longer was popular. And that's why it seems weird to us because it doesn't taste like the bananas we eat today. And yeah. I just started tearing at my clothing and shaking my head left and right. I was like, got to get a short stuff out as fast as possible yeah. about this. Delirium said in when you heard there was an OB. <laughs> that's right. An OGB. That's right. Uh, and that banana, my friends, is called, is it Michelle? Mm-hmm. The Gross Michelle, G-R-O-S-M-I-C-H-E-L. That was a banana uh, grown in the mid, uh, the beginning uh, of the mid-19th century uh, by a, a coffee grower in Jamaica. And uh, we would, you know, Big Mike would be his name here in the States, but it was mm-hmm. Gross Michelle. Mm-hmm. And this stuff was great for uh, sending around the world because it grew in little tight bunches. It was very thick skinned. It was very slow to ripen after you picked it off. And so it was really good as a as a shipping fruit until disaster struck. Isn't that right? Yeah. So So I think in the 1870s, Around then, the Gros Michel like became the dominant banana, and that lasted all the way the until top the banana. 19, <laughs> that's, how, that's right. That lasted all the way until the 1950s, when something called a Panama disease or banana wilt, which is a fungal disease that attacks banana plants, um, and it's caused by a fungus called Fusarium oxysporum forma specialis cubense. I think and you it just actually aroused the dead or something. I think it did too. <laughs> Uh, look out behind you, Chuck. Yeah. Um, it uh, This particular soil-dwelling fungus really munches down on banana crops. And so after 70 years of market dominance, the Gros Michel went basically extinct in less than a decade because this banana wilt just took a hold and spread through the banana crops like wildfire. Yeah, which is a problem when you have a monoculture, when you have all these identical essentially plants and you have a fungus that attacks it uh you're gonna have no more bananas or or any sort of monoculture yeah so uh like you said within 10 years it's gone it went from the ob to the no b (laughs) and (laughs) everyone said we got to get a new banana we invented the cavendish and that's what we eat today. It's another monoculture. So if something else yeah. comes along, that's trouble. But the Cavendish is resistant to Panama disease. And so far, so good. Uh, we're, we're, the Cavendish is doing pretty well. Yes, but they've identified a couple of diseases the Cavendish is not um, resistant to. Of and course. so if those diseases ever took hold, we'd have the same problem all over again. So the banana growing industry does not learn lessons very well. And that Cavendish is, if you are eating a banana today, basically anywhere in the world, there's genuinely a 99% chance that that banana is a Cavendish. Because not only is the Cavendish the the most widely grown variety that supplies the world's bananas, um, the, the, the Cavendishes that are grown are actually clones of one another. Because it's really, really hard to get a banana to get sexy with another banana. Sure. So they use clones. They take rhizomes from one plant, plant that, grow another plant. And so those plants are clones of one another, meaning they're not very genetically dissimilar. They're pretty much identical. And um, 
that means that if you have a disease that can take out one of those plants, it can take out all of those plants. And so the Cavendish, like you said, is in the same position that the Gros Michel is. We've just lucked out by it not happening yet. That's right. Uh, so the top banana is gone. Second banana is now dominant. And I think that's time for a break before I think of another bad pun. <laughs> and we'll be right back. Well, now when you're on the road... Driving in your truck, why not learn a thing or two from Josh and Chuck? It's Stuff You Should Know. Stuff You Should Know. All right. All righty, so now we're at the part where we talk about banana candy and everything from now or laters. I'm sorry, now and laters. I always said now or laters when I was a I kid. I did too. Uh, now and laters, which is really, that's a huge sea change now that I think about it. Yeah, because they're saying like, have them start at every chewing time. them now. <laughs> and you're going to be chewing them later still too because they don't go away very fast. Ugh. Or uh, runts or Necco wafers, any of that stuff. You've probably eaten it and said, this really doesn't taste like a banana. And like you mentioned at the beginning, it's because it doesn't taste like a Cavendish. Apparently, it does taste like a Gros Michel, and there is it's a very nuanced story to why. Yeah, because what the, the, the gist of the story, the legend as it goes, is that they created this banana flavoring to to mimic the uh, dominant banana at the time, the Gros Michel. The Gros Michel went extinct, but this banana flavoring carried on. And right. so to those of us alive today who've never had a Gros Michel, it seems weird and foreign. But it's not like the chemists like extracted Gros Michel and then injected it into candy, and then right. that's where banana flavoring came from. It's like you said, the whole thing was a lot more nuanced than that. And in fact, they developed this artificial banana flavor and then tinkered with it to make it mimic the Gros Michel, um, which, as we'll see, they apparently did pretty well. Yeah, so there was a, believe it or not, there's a uh, banana flavoring researcher, <laughs> I think just general researcher, but uh, an author named Nadia Rubenstein, mm -hmm. who did a lot of research on this, on this story, and traced the development of the, the banana flavoring back to 1912 by these New Jersey chemists, the, uh, I guess, the Fritz brothers? Sure. Fritzsche? Fritzsche? It's like -R -R Fritz and Nietzsche mixed together. S-C-H-E. It's kind of a weird name. Fritzsche. Uh, but they said that... Fritzsche. Fritzsche. <laughs> the Fritzsche brothers. <laughs> uh, but they were from New Jersey, so they didn't take any guff, and they did, didn't want anybody <laughs> poking around their banana synthesizing operation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, Nadia Rubenstein found out that they did isolate from real bananas and that they were... They had to have been Gros Michel because that was, the again, the top banana. Right. So you'd say, well, then the story is true. They took Gros Michel essence and put it into candies. Still not quite right because it gets a little more conv convoluted than that because what they extracted from the Gros Michel and identified as basically banana essence is a chemical compound called amyl acetate. And it's not just found in bananas. It's found in other fruits. And it's actually one of the other fruits that it's really kind of predominant in is pears. And um, Rubenstein found from her research that depending on the company you were buying from and the decade it was, uh, amyl acetate would be marketed in their catalogs either as banana essence or pear essence. And that over the years, it eventually just kind of evened out into a generic fruity uh, essence because it's, it is... It depends a lot on the power of suggestion and the nose or tongue of the beholder, what fruit it evokes. Yeah, and this is, I think, where it gets super cool because uh, if you live in the UK, you probably eat a little more pear than banana, or at least historically uh, mm -hmm. or culturally, mm -hmm. that's sort of the deal, than you might hear in the United States. Uh, I think Americans eat like what, like 130 bananas a year or something like that? That's everyone around the world. Oh, that's, that's how everybody. Much bananas okay. we eat. Yeah. But the UK is big on their pears and pear flavored things. So if you take the very same exact uh, vial of that, uh, what's it called again? Amyl acetate. Amyl acetate. You stick it under the nose. You first of all, you say, "Get that beer pint out of your hand," so you can smell something for a change. <laughs> and they say, "Right." 
and you put that vial under the nose of someone from the UK, they'll say, tastes like pear. And put that's that same what we vial. think about the Brits. <laughs> put that same vial under an American. First of all, you smack the the cheap light beer out of the American's hand. Okay. And you put that under their nose, and they'll say, hey, it tastes like a banana. And it's the same <laughs> thing. Right. It's the same vial. It all depends on what you've been exposed to. Remember we were talking about, like, it, like gray candy having banana flavor, if you'd even be able to, to yeah. recognize this banana flavor? Like, I was right in a really roundabout way, which I oh, love. Sure. Super love that kind of thing. Um, because you 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 have to basically tell people, this is banana candy. This flavor, it's banana flavor. Um, right. And the the thing is, though, is they, they really did kind of nail the taste of Gros Michel with this um, amyl acetate because upon later inspection, food science and, and flavoring science has gotten exponentially more sophisticated than it was back in 1912 when the Fritschy brothers were working. Mm-hmm. Um, and they found that that gross Michel bananas had more of a, a related compound called isoamyl acetate than the Cavendish does. And um, that because of this kind of thicker concentration of amyl acetate in this, this uh, banana flavoring, it evokes the gross Michel way more than it does the Cavendish. And like you said, beyond just food scientists, there is a, uh, a, a banana grower in Hawaii that does grow that top banana, the OG banana, mm-hmm. the Gross Michel. And they went out, you know, the BBC interviewed this guy and he was like, they're like, well, what does what the Gross Michel taste like? He said, it tastes like that fake banana flavor. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It tastes like a runt, basically. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and he said, you know, when I first tasted it, it made me think of banana flavoring. So uh, I want to get my hands on one of those Gross Michels. I want to go to Hawaii and, and check this thing out. Yeah, same here. Uh, next time we're in Hawaii, Chuck, I'll bring you back some gross Michelles. Because they're great for shipping. <laughs> That's right. You just drop one in the mail. Yeah, I'm, I will. I'll put some stamps on it and send it to you. <laughs> uh, you got anything else about gross Michelle or banana flavoring? No, I thought this was uh, super interesting. Me too. I loved it. So thanks for all the uh, to the listeners who wrote in to let us know about this wonderful little story. Uh, and in the meantime, everybody, short stuff is out. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.